the Chief Product and Development Officer at Tendable. Claire, how are you? I'm good, thanks. Yeah, busy week as always, um, but um, enjoying every day. Good, good stuff. So, um, Tendable then, I think for the benefit of our listeners, would you be able to give us a bit of like a, a high level overview of what Tendable does, what the problem is that you're addressing with the, the products and the mission, um, and perhaps, you know, uh, you know how it how it differs from anything else that's perhaps on the market oh good yeah good question it's um so for people who haven't heard of it which will be anyone outside of healthcare i imagine um tendable is a quality assurance platform okay. so um within healthcare you always have to make sure you're providing the best quality of care and sometimes that's about the outcomes but sometimes it's about how you deliver that care uh -huh. So you've got these organisations who have to prove to themselves and to outside um, auditors that they're providing really high quality care. And traditionally, people just had lots of paper forms that they'd fill in and the clinicians hated it. Um, then you'd end up with all these pieces of paper. So your organisation wouldn't get any really overall view of mm -hmm. where their quality is great, where they have issues, where they can make improvements. So our solution kind of covers that for them with a, an app for clinicians where they can really easily capture the information and a platform for managers and owners of organisations. So they can really take that overall view of quality assurance and quality improvement. So it takes all of the stress out of the day to day, but it makes that data really usable. Um, sure. So it becomes about quality improvement, not about capturing, not, not a tick box exercise anymore. And surely that allows uh, the care professionals to do what they're good at and, and want to do, which is actually look after the patients rather than doing an awful lot of the admin, right? Oh, yeah. It saves clinicians about 60 percent of the time and effort they would really? normally spend on this. Yeah. So it's it's wonderful because it's also a cost saver and it also frees up time to care. Yeah, nice. So you joined about a year ago, I think it was, maybe just over. Yeah, around that. Yeah, and your chief product and development officer. Um, yeah. It's not a usual title. Um, it's fairly unique. What 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 does it involve? What's the responsibilities? Yeah, it is it is a bit of an unusual one. You quite often get a CPO and a CTO in a business, yeah. um, but we've decided to combine those into a CPDO. Um, the thinking behind it is that, in my mind and in our company's mind, we make a product, and that is our product staff, our design staff development, QA, DevOps, all of us come together to make a wonderful product. So by having that all under one department run by one person in the senior management, it means we can really work as a really coherent team. Yes. OK, so you've got yourself at the top and then if you've you got like, I don't know, head of product and head of engineering or something like that underneath you. Yeah, I've got a product manager who looks after the product owners and then a head of engineering who looks after Dev and QA. Um, so the three of us together combined uh, make sure that we're looking after all those departments together. Um, but again, we try not to separate out. Uh, we try to make sure that it is a team effort. If you think about the traditional agile methodologies where you have a scrum team, which has got mm. people representing the different people, there's no reason why you should then separate that out when it comes to management. Um, throughout the whole business, we all have to have this same coherent strategy together. OK. Um, and so for you then, what what if someone was looking to move into that sort of leadership piece, what key learns have you have you had over your career and what advice could you give those people? Oh, it's a really interesting one, that, because leadership means so many different things to so many different people. Yeah. But um, in my experience, the best way to move into a leadership role is to assume a leadership role. Um, mm -hmm. Those people in teams who, while they don't have the leadership responsibility, really naturally lead and naturally coach and assist their colleagues tend to be the people who progress into leadership roles, in my experience. Mm -hmm. um, there's no there's no point saying to your manager, I want to be a leader of people if you're not already showing those characteristics in your day to day work. Um, so I would say really it's um, be the person you want to be in the future today, really. Yeah, um, yeah. So if you if you naturally lead, then you should be doing that already in your current role. And and if you found it a challenge, uh, uh, that was his assumption actually. Did if you come from you haven't come from a technical background, I don't think have you. I've come from a a, a, a semi technical background. Do I you? Used to be right, a, okay. Yeah, I used to. I, I started my career as an Oracle DBA. Ah, okay, fine. So, do you find it relatively 
easy to lead the technical teams as well as the the product teams? I think it's more of a challenge for me because um you know I you cut my arm off I bleed product it's um, it's yeah. my passion um and I don't have the same technical knowledge as the people in my technical teams um but I think really my role is to lead on vision and mission um and to allow those people who have got those skills to use those skills to the best of their <laughs> yeah, ability yeah, yeah. Um, in the same way, I think you can manage in many ways people who don't have your skill base well, as long mm. as you value their skill bases. Sure, sure, sure. Now, it's an interesting point. So, so um, which leads on to the next question, actually, because you just mentioned that you started life as, a, as an Oracle DBA. But I think most of your career has been in health technology. Is that right? Completely. Yeah. Yeah. So how have you... How have you seen, this is a massive question, how have you seen that landscape evolve over your career? And where do you think next steps are for, for health tech as a whole? I mean, we could um, it's interesting, days, health, health tech <laughs> changes, like it, it changes every four years. It's a politicised system. You know, every time we get a general election, people promise different things to the NHS, which really shapes the, the NHS environment. Um, but I would say, after the MP Fit days, where we had a national program for IT, where you had to choose from a set list of providers, um, it's become a more innovative environment. Um, and I think healthcare organisations are expecting more now. They expect integration as a standard. They expect open access to their data as a standard, uh, whereas that wasn't the case if you go back 10 years. And people are more open to newer technologies um the the nhs and healthcare in general is a risk averse industry for obvious mm -hmm. reasons mm -hmm. uh, but there's been so many really really good examples of bringing innovative technologies into healthcare now that that fear is really lessened which opens up the environment for these new scale up startup organizations to really make a difference in the healthcare environment yeah 100 percent. and do you think that i mean ai is just like everywhere at the moment isn't it yeah everywhere it's not coming for doctors and nurses jobs, is it? It's not coming for doctors and nurses jobs, but in the same way that Tendable has reduced that need by 60% to do that paperwork, AI reduces the need in a lot of other areas. Diagnostics is the obvious yeah, area where sure. AI is coming first into healthcare, but it's in so many different areas that we can use the the um, the generative AI programs. We've we've got um, various plans that we're using it for at the moment, um, and so have pretty much every health tech company. Yeah. Um, and it's it's that same concept. How can we take that day to day task, which doesn't need your clinician, and get a computer to do that for us, so that that yeah, clinician absolutely. can use their time to the best of their possible um ability and and that's what technology is there for and i think you, you know I, I have a lot of these conversations with, with various people and that seems to be the general consensus let let the computer do what the computer's good at the transactional you know data bits and let the human do the empathic bits that a computer just can't do um that seems to be seems to be the general consensus across the board yeah, and there are some things that as humans we're not that good at. Um, if mm. you give someone huge reams of data, it's really hard for us to find the insight because uh, we don't have the time. Or, and actually our brains just can't do it, but computers yeah. can. And so now we have these generative AI concepts which you can bring into anything. We can then say, let all of that trudge work be done by the computer. It will do it better than we could do yeah. it. Um, but who do you want stood by your bedside? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I would much prefer for my nurses, my doctors, my allied health professionals to be with me, caring for me, than sat at a computer trying to work out a data model. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. So um, lastly, then, back to Tendable. Um, what's coming up? Anything exciting? Some new developments? Oh. What can you share? What? Or your, or your uh, it's, it's, your chest. <laughs> it's a very exciting world we're in at the moment. I would say the thing I probably can share now is we've we've got this fantastic model that we use for our hospitals and they love it. They genuinely do. It's a wonderful experience going onto a ward and having these people say how much they love your app and how much it makes their life better. Mm. But just because they love it doesn't mean we can't make it better. Um, so we're really obsessive over our user experience. 
Um, and we've recently spent a huge amount of resource and time going through every single tap of every single screen of every single thing that a clinician does in our app. Um, so we've got a big release coming out on July 3rd. One example there is that currently it takes about 19 taps to complete one process in the okay. um, in the app. And as of July 3rd, that will take two taps. Oh. Um, and it makes oh, any, anybody who works in technology will know the absolute joy we have bringing that to our clinicians. That, yeah, I mean, I think anyone's the same though. Just, just any, any, anything clunky, people are just like, oh, don't like it. But thing so is, any, any... the nineteen taps, they lovely. That it's, right. it's so much better than anything else which they've ever used with the nineteen taps. Uh, they wow. don't want it to be better. They're not asking for it to be better. So this is this is a real delightful moment for our customers. And as you know, what we're always trying to do is delight our customers. Yeah. So to take something they love and make it that that much better, um, I just I cannot wait to get out with them. Ah, fantastic. Well, Claire, that that's it. That's all we've got time for. Um, thank you so much. Um, it's been really insightful. Um, and guys, when you're listening, if you do like the content, please make sure to give us uh, a like and a follow and a share. Um, and we will be with you again every Wednesday. So this has been Tech Talks, the People and Planet podcast. Thanks again, Claire. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.